and of course the permanent secretary here at the office of the Prime Minister, Audrey Sewell. Please be seated. Prime Minister the Most Honorable Andrew Holness will now make an opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Whereas by virtue of Section 21 of the Constitution of Jamaica, the Governor General may make a proclamation declaring that a state of public emergency exists. And whereas the Governor General has been advised and is satisfied that action has been taken or is immediately threatened by persons or bodies of persons of such a nature and on so extensive a scale as to likely endanger the public safety of the community specified in the schedule, the Governor General has so declared that a state of public emergency exists in the communities specified in the schedule, that is to say, the entire area comprising the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine. This proclamation of a state of public emergency shall remain in force unless revoked for a period of 14 days or for such longer periods, not exceeding three months as both Houses of Parliament may determine by a resolution supported by a two-thirds majority of the members of each House. Ladies and gentlemen, this should come as no surprise. The last time I was here, I virtually indicated that the next time that I'm at this podium declaring a state of public emergency, um, there would be one in the parish of Clarendon. Um, St. Catherine is a addition to that uh, by virtue of the statistics and all the intelligence that we have. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Governor General has declared, and I am merely announcing, that a state of public emergency exists in the parishes of St. Catherine and Clarendon. I'll now call on the Chief of Defence Staff, or Commissioner of Police, to give further details. Uh, good morning, everyone. The high level of violent crime which has, is being experienced in the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine since the start of the year is at a scale and nature such that it greatly endangers public safety. The Clarendon Division has historically been one of the most violent regions in the country with a number of gangs engaged in inter and intra-gang conflicts or other criminal enterprise. Already, since the start of 2019, the Clarendon Division has recorded the second highest number of murders at 100. The St. Catherine South Police Division has seen an increase in murders of 50% over last year's number to currently sit at 91 murders since the beginning of the year. St. Catherine North Division while experiencing a reduction of 14% over last year, still has had 66 murders this year so far. The gang warfare and other criminal acts perpetrated by gangs has created fear among citizens and has caused the disruption of livelihoods in sections of the parishes. The fear that is associated with this level of violence has undermined the daily lives of these communities and the residents. As a consequence and in consultation with the Chief of Defense Staff, we requested that a state of public emergency be declared in the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine. As has been demonstrated through previous and current SOEs, this methodology has been very effective in reducing violent crime. This is achieved while simultaneously reducing violent confrontation with the security forces. By way of update, we have seen reductions in murders in St. James, Westmoreland, and Hanover of 24%, 61%, and 50% respectively when compared with the similar period prior to the de declaration of the 
Tri-Parish SOE. Similarly, in St. Andrew's South, there has been a 75% drop in murders when compared to the similar period before the state of emergency. As we continue to advance strategies to reduce violent crime across all divisions, utilizing the range of policing tools, especially a heavy emphasis on investigations and the use of technology, building better relationships with communities, as well as institutional capacity building activities, we must save the lives of our citizens and reduce the fear that families and communities feel when violence goes unchecked. We feel it is our duty to stand between those who would do harm and those in danger. Our objectives, therefore, are to establish and maintain a period of low violent crime in the volatile communities within these parishes, to curtail the free movement of criminal gangs and weapons and deny them the opportunity to commit violent crime, to disrupt criminal enterprise and to provide the opportunity for greater investigative focus on perpetrators of violent crimes and their facilitators. We seek the support and cooperation of the residents and persons doing business in or transiting the declared areas and indeed all Jamaicans. There may be some traffic delays and inconvenience, but we ask for your patience and understanding. The public can assist by contacting Crime Stop, which as always is completely confidential, by complying with the security officers at checkpoints, by adhering to curfew guidelines, and by notifying us at the JCF of any breaches of professional conduct by our own members. The JCF remains committed to respect for all, rule of law, and being a force for good. Help us to keep you safe. Thank you, Major General Anderson. And now we'll have Lieutenant General Rocky Mead, Chief of Defense Staff. Thank you very much. At 6 a.m. this morning, the Jamaica Defense Force and the Jamaica Constabulary Force deployed to effect the declared state of emergency. This state of emergency will cover the entire area comprising the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine within the established parish borders as follows. The eastern boundary starts at the easternmost point of St. Catherine at the coastal intersection of the parish borders of St. Catherine and St. Andrew. The eastern boundary then extends in a north-northwesterly direction along the shared parish borders of St. Catherine and St. Andrew, then along the shared border of St. Catherine and St. Mary. The northern boundary extends in a westerly direction along the borders shared between St. Catherine, uh, St. Mary, and St. Anne, St. Anne, and by uh, Clarendon with St. Anne, extending to the point of the intersection of the borders of Clarendon, St. Anne, Manchester, and Trelawney. The western boundary extends in a southeasterly direction along the shared parish border of Clarendon and Man Manchester all the way to the coastline. The southern boundary extends along the entire coastal areas of Clarendon and St. Catherine back to the southernmost point of the shared border of St. Catherine and St. Andrew. While persons may be concerned about the implications of the security operations on their everyday lives, we want to assure citizens that both the Jamaica Defense Force and the Jamaica Constabulary Force have been properly trained and oriented to give the utmost respect to basic human and citizen rights of all persons within the communities. Our exemplary record in other areas in which uh, states of emergency have been declared is testimony to our commitment to carrying out our duties in a lawful and respectful manner. We will continue this approach in Clarendon and St. Catherine. Nonetheless, we urge persons to acquaint themselves with the regulations and requirements governing a state of emergency in order to easily and conveniently transit the parishes that have been declared. During this period of the state of emergency, citizens will encounter very op various operations such as highly visible vehicle checkpoints. The purpose of these checkpoints 
is to add a robust element of security for residents as well as other citizens transiting the areas. We ask persons that for ease and simplicity as they approach checkpoints to lower their windows during dark and during dark periods to turn on their roof lights. We also implore citizens that as they comply with the guidelines to transit the area, they should not slow down unnecessarily beyond what is reasonable just to observe the activities as at the checkpoints as this may cause traffic buildup. We are aware that the areas just declared have some significant arteries into and out of the city, and we are going to be very flexible in ensuring that we minimize traffic delays while we still ensure security. As we pledge to carry out our operations with the professionalism and respect that we are known for, we are also seeking the cooperation and support of all Jamaicans by imploring them to uh, call in as the commissioner indicated and the numbers again um, uh, the JDF number 876-837-8888 and the police is line 311 as you heard before. In closing let me reaffirm that the JDF and JCF have both the commitment and capability to achieve the success in Clarendon and St. Catherine similar to what we have achieved in other areas where states of emergency have been declared. We welcome the continued support that we have gotten from citizens and various groups, including the private sector, as we strive to, strive to bring violent crime to normal levels. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Meade. And now we'll have the Honorable Dr. Horace Chang, the Minister of National Security. Thank you. The government of Jamaica continues to regard the lives of our Jamaican citizens as the primary right and we take every measure to protect the lives of Jamaican and save Jamaican lives. The, the enhanced measure of security in the area declared is part of that strategy as we proceed to ensure our secu security forces will have the required infrastructure and equipment to deal effectively in the long term. I'd like to just remind the country of the successes in the recorded areas. South St. Andrew reduction of 70% since the start of the special state of public emergency. Indeed, the rate of murder there was running at about five per week, 5.7 per week, is now down to 1.21. Questions have been raised in section of the Western Asia, where three parts are involved. The data was provided, the specific data was provided by the Commissioner of Police, but I'd like to remind the cities of Jamaica, the real comparison is what was happening in St. James, Hanover, and Westmoreland in 2017. The number of homicides in St. James, for example, are at 6.33 per week. That's approximately one per day in the city of Montego Bay prior to the SOE of 2018. During that period, the following year, it was reduced to two per week. You have seen a slight uptick, but crime in Jamaica, like other activities, are business for those who are involved in organization of criminal activity. They adjust their business activity to try and continue their success in the area they are. The security forces are aware of changes they are doing and will make adjustment and will be able to continue a process of saving a citizen's life. Some of the adjustment criminals are making that is known Gangs which were splintered are reconvening and reorganizing to increase their capacity and their network in communities. That we are aware of, and again, let me assure the citizens that the security forces will take necessary steps to make adjustments to ensure the success we have had in areas like South St. Andrew will continue across the various areas that we have taken steps to ensure we can keep the citizens safe the protection of the lives of Jamaica and the priority. In the process server, we continue to respect the rights of all Jamaicans, but we have to ensure we have the, the security force have the tools to ensure that those who will disrupt and take the lives of Jamaican citizens can be taken off the streets until we in a position to maintain that with normal policing activity. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to again reinforce the fact that the state of public emergencies 
have demonstrated that we save lives. We restore public order and public safety in the areas where we have seen extreme criminal activity taking place. The security forces has been oriented to de respect the rights of the citizens as they proceed to do this. And uh, I'm confident that the impact they have had in the areas we are currently operating will be translated into the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine. I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Horace Chang, the Minister of National Security. May I welcome also the listening and viewing audience, radio and television, and those too joining us live on social media via the streams on various websites and the Prime Minister's social media pages. And now, ladies and gentlemen of the media, it's time for your questions. Please raise your hand to indicate that you have a question to ask. Once we identify you, please take the microphone, identify yourself, your name, and the media entity you represent, and then ask your question. Are there any questions at this time? To my right, I acknowledge, uh, I think it's Laverne. Could you say your full name and your media entity? Um, good morning, Prime Minister. Good morning to members of the head table. A question for the Prime Minister and a question for the Minister of National Security. Honorable Prime Minister, the numbers in St. James um, are approaching 100 in terms of murders. Um, the, 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 the constraints of the security forces are well documented. Are you concerned that we, you run the risk of watering down the effectiveness of the state of emergencies when we start to have them in St. James, in St. Catherine, in Clarendon, and um, as it is in um, South St. Andrew? That's for you. And for the Minister of National Security, there are reports of a gastroenteritis outbreak at the Freeport Police Station. I think it has been cleared up now, but I want to find out what can you, first of all, can you speak to what happened, and can you also indicate if there are provisions to ensure that, insofar as Karen and Nancy Katchen are concerned, that we don't have the same problem? Thank you, Oliver. Let me, let me say that we don't declare a state of public emergency in an arbitrary way. You will recall, because I'm certain that you were one of the journalists asking, when are you going to do Clarendon? And you would recall that my answer then was that when we have put in place all the necessary resources and make the necessary precautions, such as how the persons who are detained are held, the standards at which they are held, um, the provisions for our security forces who are operating, not always under the best circumstances, and I take this opportunity to commend them for the work that they have been doing in the SOEs and the zones of special operations. Um, so, yes, I'm always concerned about stretching our resources to the limit. But in management, sometimes you, you recognize that you don't know your true limit until you have tested it. And... Uh, the Jamaica Constabulary Force and the Jamaica Defense Force uh, continue to prove that they can stand up to the challenges. But we also know that there are hard limits, hard limits in terms of human resources. We continue to expand our capacity. We have a very robust recruitment policy, um, both in the JCF and the JDF. You may recall that Two years ago, we launched the Jamaica Service Corps, which is administered by the, the um, Jamaica Defense Force. And that has been working very well. Recently, the commissioner has announced uh, the new recruitment strategy of the JCF. So we are trying to expand. But even though we expand, the expansion doesn't come into effect right away. In other words, it takes time to train. And then you have to give them some experience. And uh, that process is ongoing. Uh, we are able to do this today precisely because we have invested in increasing the capacity of both the JDF and the JCF. Um, I'm not telling you that it is not without sacrifice and challenge, but as we stand here, we can say with uh, um, certainty that we have taken into consideration all potential threats and challenges 
and the deployment will be of the standard that the public has grown accustomed. Thank you. Uh, I'm aware of an outbreak of gastroenteritis in the St. James here division. I am not yet had a detailed report from the public that depends on the cause of it, but all our lockups have been put in acceptable working conditions and um, in fact providing more funding for food supply to the various institutions. I am confident that the particular incident is, I said, um, uh, an aberration of what normally happens around and you can and we'll monitor what's happening in all of them. In fact, I think St. Catherine has some, one of the best quality lockup at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Minister. Another question coming from my right. I believe it's Herman. Could you just identify your media house? And Thanks. Yourself? Herman Green, TVJ Newsroom. This uh, question is for Dr. Chang, Minister Chang. Uh, regard, we, we know the figures are down in these areas where SOEs are implemented. However, there are still concerns about uh, killings happening and yeah. in terms of the results, in terms of persons arrested, charged, and uh, weapons that are, are confiscated or seized. Can we expect any change in those SOEs, operations there, and also in this new one in Clarendon, St. Catherine? The operations strictly the responsibility of the commissioner and the CDS I indicated that there will be some killings. The, the gangs are operational. And as indicated in my own presentation, gangs are criminal business enterprises which make adjustment to their business operations when they see pressure come on the business. And it, there have been some changes in the St. James Division, which is referred to where we have had what appear to be some um, traumatic and tragic killings and that, that has caused concern to the wider community. But if you look at the numbers, it's not as dramatic as suggested by the Becari. We have had a, it is two during the period, la the same period last year per week. It ticked up to 2.3 because of a, you know, events in the last two weeks. We are aware, I said, of some changes in the operational nature of the criminal gangs and the security forces are taking steps to adjust their own operation to deal with that. But if you need any further comments, then the commissioner would like to comment on it. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so in St. James at the moment, this year, we have increased the number of firearms recovered uh, by some, um, it's, it's now 73 recovered as opposed to 63 last year at this time. And we've re recovered three times the amount of ammunition. At this time last year, we had recovered 1,500 rounds this year we've recovered 4,500 rounds. And this is indicative of a lot of the work that's being done under the ambit of other police work being done under the ambit of the states of emergency, uh, including community interventions, including building out our intelligence network, and including the investigations that are being done. We're also receiving a number of convictions for gun offenses possession of firearms in particular, uh, and we have been getting some of those convictions using some specific scientific um, evidence in the courts. In one week, we had 22 convictions in the high courts down in St. James. So everything's happening at the same time. Uh, the state of emergency is not a substitute for other police work. It's being done on top of all of the other police work that is being done. Thank you. Anderson? Uh, Prime Minister, you want to make an intervention? I, I suspect I'll be making closing remarks because, uh, but just to say, don't rush off because since I have you gathered, I have yes, uh, some other things I would like to share with you. But just on this matter, the triple threat of guns, gangs, and dons continue to exist. That is it. Um, I want to reinforce what the Commissioner has said. The government is not using the state of public emergency as a substitute for regular policing. What the state of emergency does is to provide a respite in the number of crimes, in particular murders, that are taking place. 
it helps to expand the, the number of uh, law enforcement personnel that we have on the ground. It helps to restrict the free movement of the criminal enterprise. And then that gives regular policing an increased ability to do their work. So I want you to pay close attention to what the commissioner said. Within the spaces that we have the states of public emergency, and even outside of those spaces, we have been able to interdict, bring before the courts, prosecute, and have successful convictions. And the commissioner gave you the number of successful convictions that we have had in St. James. In addition, it has given greater capacity to regular law enforcement to do regular law enforcement. So they are doing more community policing. And I want you to take a look, if you get a chance, at what is happening in Salt Spring. They are doing their search and recovery of firearms. They are doing public order operations on the streets of Montego Bay. So it is not a substitute. It, it, it helps. And it is, we, we are not relying on it as the only tool. But as the commissioner says, we're working all the strategies. We are using all the tools in our toolbox to ensure that we can protect the lives of the Jamaican citizen. I want to reinforce what the Minister of National Security has said. And in my last presentation here, when we declared the SOE in St. Andrew South, we pointed out that a significant portion of murders in Jamaica, a significant percentage of murders in Jamaica, are gang-related. The gangs posture as if they are protectors of the communities. They posture as if they are giving opportunities to young people. They even posture as if they are legitimate business people. But I don't want the public to be pulled into that illusion. They are a criminal business. I mean, I think the word enterprise is too good for them. Right? They are, they, are, they are criminals. That's what they are. And they prey upon the communities. They prey upon your children. They literally recruit them. You may not see it as recruitment, but the done in your community, and I'm certain you know who they are. They see your son going to school, doesn't have proper shoes, doesn't have lunch money, and all of a sudden, they are providing them with lunch money and clothes and bringing them to places. And before you know it, your son is sidetracked. Some of the criminal enterprises are so sophisticated that they look for the brightest, pay their school fee, and encourage them to join law enforcement, to become lawyers. That is the level of thinking that some of the criminals are doing now. They want to know the bright ones because they want them to help them with cyber crimes. The government isn't sitting down idly and not paying attention to these things. That is what we mean when we say we have to develop our intelligence capabilities so that we know we may not get specifics as to who is doing it but we can analyze general trends. And then that helps us to structure our policies. And of course, as we strengthen our intelligence, both our human intelligence, signal intelligence, and other forms of intelligence gathering, we get to have more specific information. And we do have specific information on some of these operations. So sometimes the statistics that you see can be disheartening. And the public is always swayed, particularly in this silly season, which we hope will come to an end soon. And that, of course, has an impact on what is said in the press and when you wake up in the morning, how you feel about yourself and your country. And it does affect mood. But I want you to appreciate that the government can't always be swayed by mood. We have to be empirical in how we operate. And you will see from how we have operated that we have been very strategic and very deliberate in the things that we are doing. And it has had an effect. It has had an impact. The impact that you are seeking, which is 
you know, we want to get our murder rate down to zero or to some number which is acceptable above zero, which I don't know what that number is. But that impact that you are seeking is possible. But you have to keep faith. And you have to search for the good news sometimes because what is presented, the good news is not always at the top of the pile. You have to dig underneath it. My job is to present to you a balanced view, present to you what are the threats, where we have failed, and of course, where we have had successes. One area in particular you will hear portrayed as bad news. We are finding less guns in the SOEs. But if you were to stop and really analyze that statement, in the first few months of the SOE, when the strategical posture and operational um, design was in searches and the interdiction of Sorry, that person wasn't talking to me. But, but in the first few months of the SOE, clearly the, the operational posture would be to conduct more searches. And yes, you would find more guns because the guns are there. But after you have had the SOE for a period of time and you have found the guns, you're not going to find the same guns again. You have to take them off the street. That space is now an unsafe space for people to hide weapons. So they will seek to move them. That space is not a safe place for hidden weapons because people will share information as to where those guns are. Yes, we can increase our effort. And yes, we have, and you will see that we have found marginally more um, this time, this year, um, than we found this time last year. But it is not a statement to say that the SOE has failed because we have found less firearms. In fact, uh, it is more a statement of the success of the, the SOE, because if you keep on finding more and more guns, then you would have to be wondering, um, you know, first of all, where are they coming from, and whether or not your operations have been effective in preventing guns from, from coming in. Generally, the objective of the government is to bring our murder rate down to at least the regional average of homicide per 100,000. And regionally, by the last statistics that we have from the United Nations, um, that would be around 16 per 100,000. We can do it. We have a five-year strategic plan to do it. We are one year already into that five-year plan. And we have moved our homicide rate per 100,000 from 61 per 100,000 to we are, last year we are, we are at 40, 47 per 100,000. We, we are just about there now, but the objective is to further bring that down. And this is an objective that all Jamaicans should rally around. All Jamaicans should support that because the life that is saved could very well be your own. So in closing off on the SOE, I would... And since I have the, the media here, I would want to bring you up to date on the situation in the Bahamas. Um, just before and during the hurricane, I've been in direct contact with Prime Minister Minis of the Bahamas. And uh, uh, he has given me an update on the situation in the islands that have been affected in the Bahamas. You would have seen in the media that those islands that are affected, affected, that the devastation is extensive. Um, there are already um, partner nations on the ground in the Bahamas assisting with the search and rescue. Jamaica has responsibility under SEDEMA for the Northern Caribbean. And we will be sending an advance mission to the Bahamas this morning. We will be flying them in um, on our aircraft. Uh, and then later this evening, we are going to be sending a full mission, um, our full disaster assistance response team. That is the team that we had sent to Dominica. Um, and the, 
they are a very well trained, very well experienced um, disaster assistance and recovery um, team. They will be airlifted for us in partnership with uh, our friends, our Canadian friends. Um, they will be airlifting both men and equipment. So Jamaica will have um, presence in the Bahamas uh, and we will be at the disposal of the Bahamian government if they require any further assistance. I'll, ask, I'll invite the Chief of Defense Staff to give more details of uh, Jamaica's um, assistance to the Bahamas effort. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, we've been in dialogue since the uh, hurricane was approaching uh, the Bahamas and it was clear that it would have an impact. And um, we have had our disaster assistance response team on standby. Um, we received today the formal invitation uh, to support. As the Prime Minister indicated, we're going to send our small aircraft with an advanced team led by Lieutenant Colonel Godfrey Sterling, um, who will head off shortly. Um, as the PM mentioned, we don't have our own capacity at the moment to move our um, entire DART ourselves, um, uh, but we, we are getting support from Canada. And um, we have notified them. They have agreed that they can help and they are going to be sending an aircraft down of the appropriate size that can assist in moving our team. We're going to deploy uh, with resources to be able to uh, sustain our people uh, for up to a month. Um, and we are going to, we are prepared to send our Coast Guard vessel with additional uh, supplies for sustainment of our troops and some uh, relief supplies for the uh, Bahamians. Um, and once we get there, we will uh, get into uh, details of what we'll do. But certainly some of the immediate things would be to help um, in setting up uh, temporary bases for not just us, but the Bahamian uh, Coast Guard to function from, to assist in um, additional rescues, to assist in recovery, to help with route clearances, to help with uh, logistics arrangements, uh, including movement and distribution of supplies. And this we will do with our other uh, international partners, some of whom are already on location. And um, while we're deploying initially for a month, should there be a need for our extended presence, then that would be discussed with the Prime Minister and, um, you know, we will be committed to support as long as we have the resources, ability, and, um, and funding to do. Um, just for clarification, we're only halfway through the hurricane season. The DART that we are deploying now is not our entire capacity for uh, disaster relief and humanitarian assistance. As I deploy that team today, I am reconstituting another team of 100 to be on standby in case uh, uh, um, any uh, other support is required anywhere else, including if, uh, God forbid, we should need that support here in Jamaica. So I just want to be clear that we are not uh, sending our entire capacity. Um, we are always having people on standby uh, for, for this support. And these are not additional persons. We adjust our various operations as uh, the, the need arises. But I always ensure that having deployed, there are another set of troops briefed, tested, medical examination, vaccines, etc., and ready to deploy just in case we have another event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lieutenant General Meade, and thank you so much to all our presenters, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, Prime Minister, Major General Anthony Anderson, the Commissioner of Police, and Dr. Horace Chang, the Minister of National Security, as well as our Attorney General, the uh, Senator Robert Morgan, and of course, our Permanent Secretary here. Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen joining us on radio, television, and social media, we thank you so much, and we expect that you would join us again at another time in future. Good morning.
to all our presenters, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, Prime Minister, Major General Anthony Anderson, the